All right, the broadcast is started, and I wish everybody a very good morning out there in viewing land and YouTube this morning. I have a very special guest and friend with me today. This is Barry Littleton. He is an experiencer. Uh, he has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to this kind of a subject, and I think that you're all going to be very fascinated with what Barry has to offer. Uh, Barry, I'm going to let you just run with this. We're calling it Frat House Friday today. And just, you know, whatever you think needs to be shared, you can share. You might start with how you got started in all of this and uh, just tell the audience what uh, what this is all about. Well, no problem. How you doing? First of all, have, thank you for having me on. Um, I'm honored to be here, definitely. Had a few technical problems, which occurs to me many times before doing one of these. So <laughs> I may not necessarily be getting attacked myself, but I think that sometimes the technology does. So. Um, <laughs> anyway, so how'd you want to start off? Um, well, you might tell us how you got started with your experiencing and, uh, oh, I think, uh, as I recall, you got started as a child. So, you know, you can kind of start off into that. And then as it progressed in the, you know, the different life forms that you have experienced and the, the alien technology, I am absolutely fascinated with. Uh, I don't understand it all, but hey, we got all have to learn sometime, don't we? Yeah, well, me neither. Me neither. You know, and I've seen this thousands of years beyond what we have now, so that always makes it hard. Um, basically, I was um, one of those individuals that was kind of born with um, soul life memories intact. So I had some past life memories um, from a very young age, and it started conflicting with uh, things I was hearing in school. And then on the top of that, I was having like experiences where terrible insomnia and which led to worse insomnia, even in my adult years, way worse now. But um, waking up at night, not at home or in a field that was behind where my parents stayed just for a second and being in like some type of a school um, that wasn't the school I was at during the day and being really burned out during the day because I seemed to be up 24 seven, you know? And things like that, though, as a child, as you begin to age and your mold, your perception gets molded, changes. You start, you know, either just accepting as, oh, it must have been my imagination, you know, kind of like a couple of friends I had that would come by and play with me. And I was always well supervised. So I was very little always alone for any period of time. But occasionally there'd be a friend that would come by and hang out with me that didn't go to my school. But he was playing with me. He was little, so I assumed he was my age, you know. And then I come to later find out that this individual was not actually human, you know, until he did something that I that kind of broke my perception, you know. But interestingly, when everyone else would come around, he had to leave. <laughs> I mean, it, it, we we're hanging out playing for two minutes. He had to leave when other people showed up. So a lot of my experiences started like that and coming in a type of dream or vision type of deal, almost astral, we could say. And they were definitely happening, but they weren't very tangible, okay? Not tangible enough to where if I was going to tell somebody, which Lord knows I'm doing now, but if I was going to tell someone, it wasn't provable, okay? So I started requesting more physical contact that I could actually prove. And at a certain point around the sixth grade, you know, things started getting so intense that uh, I knew that this was real. OK, but um, nonetheless, when I started requesting physical contact and I tried everything, that was a few years after that E.T. came out and the kid built a shortwave radio. I tried doing that. I tried doing uh, what is the, 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 the flat Morse cord, Morse code to the Andromeda galaxy. I tried all sorts of stuff. It didn't work. I tried my telepathy. I'm a natural telepath, as many people that are hearing this. Um, some of us so strong we can't turn it off. And it almost invades our lives, but um, that didn't work either. I couldn't call them in, and these beings were highly telepathic, telepathic. So those are what I would call childhood experiences. Then that graduates, I didn't have any experiences for probably five, six years. And then when I get about 19, they did come physically. And when they came physically, or at least I, I was having a physical experience again, and this one though is so tangible that somebody else is with me, and they're seeing the ships also. And after we see the ships, we're missing about four hours of missing time. Okay. And the ships are definitely telepathic. They were, 
you could feel the love coming off him. It didn't feel like a negative experience at all. It almost couldn't have been. But yet the missing time and the fact that I like experiencing consciousness, whether it be through uh, self-hypnosis, pranayama yoga, I practice that all the time, uh, things to try to induce the astral body projection. I tried all that type of things, and it didn't uh, exactly always work. You know what I mean? So this one is a... I was unable to retrain, re, retrieve these missing, this missing time, these memories. That was very disturbing. And to be quite honest with you, that wasn't the only time. It happened three times. It's individual, and I was with her for a long time. And uh, she eventually got the heck away from me and said that when I got away from him, that stuff stopped because that was real. I was missing almost 20 hours of missing time, you know, and uh, four separate experiences. And fortunately, um, that type of delusion is not shared. You know what I mean? So if I was having a brain malfunction or some sort of a chemical imbalance in my brain, that would have proved it. <laughs> well, now, proved it. <laughs> do you think that uh, the when you have these encounters and you lose the missing time, is this a mind um, wipe of some kind that the aliens do, or is this a natural natural phenomenon in our own physical makeup that does not allow us to remember the encounter that we've had or, or a dimensional shift or how, how do you think it works? More the latter. You know, I will say this, I kind of stay up, say a lot now since speaking out, I, I know how many people have been abducted and have negative experiences. I have not. My experiences have been very positive. I was trying to help induce whatever was happening. And part of what, to answer your question, part of it is, um, I, you know, I thought that I was like, Oh my Lord, have they wiped my mind? You know, because when I start looking at ufology, what I find first is Barney and Betty Hill, of course. And right. Barney is, it was a brother. <laughs> and it, they're messing with his genitals and all stuff like that. I said, oh, yeah. no. <laughs> I knew that that probably is what happened to me, but not being able to remember still made it bad. But what actually caused that lack of being able to remember is the vibration, the speed that these, these beings are on, okay? Uh, it's so much faster than what we are right now. And uh, in that way, when you're dealing with consciousness that's moving that fast, it makes the retention of memory during the event horizon it's itself very difficult, okay? Because this is starting to happen to occur in almost, for me, what they call theta state of consciousness, which is very deep, almost into a type of sleep, okay? But yet the, the experiences were physical. So I had to figure out that it was actually then, because I thought that, oh no, did they wipe my mind? You know, but <laughs> it wasn't that as much as I wasn't able to remember due to the speed of the information transfer and the dimensional distortment. Because um, the ships I've been on are not in the same dimension on the outside and inside. And you know, funny as it sounds, you know, as a kid, this stuff was driving me crazy. So I was trying to find frames of reference. So let me just start things like Star Trek. Doctor Who. And I was, everybody's wondering, why are you so into that all the time? They, I wouldn't tell them why. But you know, and Doctor Who, the TARDIS, is bigger on the inside than the outside. And they explain how it's in different dimensions, the outside and inside. The inside of, of these crafts I've been on are dimensionally out of sync with us in a way that it was very hard for me to survive there. But for them, the vibrational is enough that they can communicate with us more. But a lot of them won't come out of the ships. And also, I had to understand that a lot of these beings, these crew members, didn't have bodies. They were non-physicals. So it was like a telepathic type of entity. Yeah, all of all of the contacts have been telepath, uh, te te telethought. I call it because sometimes pictures come with them along with a knowing. So it's a little different than telepathy with humans. It's stronger. You know, humans you just kind of pick up things a little bit, but these guys, it's a direct interface. So, does, that, does that answer your question at all, or am I going too far off? No, that, that's fine. No, that that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, and with the different alien beings, I would assume that they would have different types of, uh, I don't know how to even word it, uh, encounters or phenomenon with the way that they'll manifest, and then their ships manifest. I, I wouldn't expect it to be straight across the board that they're all alike. No, not at all. And something that was 
very disconcerting for me was that uh, when I looked at modern ufology, it didn't conform at all to the experiences I was having. It didn't look at most of the, the ships, only one of them looked similar to that, two of them actually, but then they start morphing. There was nothing about that, okay, about them morphing. There was nothing about um, the telepathy that comes along with these, the basal tones that come along with some of these ships that kind of almost nullify your, feel, your, your, your fear. And it was definitely not much about beings that were seen outside of the little grays. There are a bunch of types of grays, but I personally, this lifetime, have not experienced them, okay? So I'm not discrediting that at all. We have you know, so many people that have now. There's no doubt about that. But um, I just personally have not. But the beings I was experiencing were very different. You know what I mean? And I didn't see illustrations of any of them except for one that was insectoid around anywhere. So that was kind of disconcerting also. You know what I mean? But that's part of the disconnect I think we all have. Most people... If you even say you watch Star Trek, you're going to get dogged out, let alone if you say, hey, I've been on the ship, and guess what? Most of them were non-physical. And for me, a couple of years ago, I had a near-death experience with a car accident, which I, um, with all my wisdom, wasn't wearing my seatbelt. I took uh, four catastrophic traumatic brain injuries and went through every window in my Trans Am. And um, so they said that uh, I would be lacking life memories, most likely, long-term memories especially. But the creator saw it differently, you know. But um, so basically, for me to say, uh, you know, now I'm talking now, but to say, well, hey, gosh, he hit his head and he sees aliens, you know, that doesn't go over good at brunch or whatever. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, out of out of the species that you have encountered, and I don't know if that's the correct terminology even to call them a species, but. Uh, the different types of aliens that you have encountered. How many? How many species is it that you think that you've uh, interacted with? There's a lot, you know, a lot, and I've come to aware of so many more than what I'm aware of now. But um, you know, I I spent a lot of times trying because most of these different beings were different. I encountered amphib an amphibian, a different types of insectoids, many that did not have bodies. Um, and as I found, as I got later, I could correlate uh, a type of beings I call charters, which look like people. They look just like me and you with very few differences. But if you can feel energy, you'll feel that these people feel like, gosh, like maybe they're from thousands of years in our future. Like what we can be when we aren't trying to kill each other anymore. Right. But every seven years they come around and have interacted with me briefly, then they're gone. But they just come out of the crowd. They look like people. Okay, I call them charters. I've come to find out later that these are actually, I think, more historians. And a lot of us that are lifetime experiencer, have, experiencers have encountered every seven years, somebody might come out, or you've seen them, you meet them somewhere, and usually, uh, for me, it was a bookstore, I've heard that, airports and things like that, where someone just comes up to you and says something profound. And you interact with them for a minute, two minutes, and they're gone back in the crowd, and you just kind of go along with your life. But you kind of, it, it stuns you in a way, the energy that comes off them, you're like, who was that? And how many times have you met somebody that was, you know, uncanny, and then they go back in the crowd? I, I'm not religious, but I think it's maybe the Christian Bible that says often men have entertained angels and been unaware of it. People have entertained right. angels and been unaware of it. I think there's a lot more to that than meets the eye. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, would you consider the charters to be Palladian? You know, no. Um, I'm getting to think that they're humans from our future. You know, I've been hearing okay. a great deal. You know, lately a great deal of dissemination has come up among, about the Palladians between Caucasian experiencers and black and ethnic experiencers. All right. And it's been said quite a bit that Pleiadians worked with the Nazis and that they're jump, time jumping and there's a renegade, renegade fashion, faction of them is being said. And then also you've got others like Barbara Marchanique that are preaching the love and light and all that. And I know a lot of people that are interacting with the Pleiadians. So it's not for me to judge. I have met um, beings that called themselves Plagiarians with a J. And I actually did a couple of videos on YouTube, but I uh, showed these beings in one of the short videos I did. Um, they were actually throne beings. I say that because they sat, they appeared to be on not chairs, but 
these columns of light, these pillars of light, okay? And then they had these, what would be like quasi-crystals in the middle of their chest. And in the back of their head, it sounds strange, but it's like it wasn't quite corporeal, like it was going light filaments going into space, okay? Uh -huh. it took a lot to deal with that. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, it led me into something like J.J. Hurtock's book, um, The Keys of Enoch. He talks about thrown energies. So that had me to look that up, you know, and thrown energies, when you look that up, it's a type of throne. There's another definition, and not just a chair, but also a type of celestial being that is about the equivalent of an angel, but not quite classified. So that's, um, you know, a, a situation like that. But, uh, you know, seeing different beings like that, and when I say I've been on a multidimensional ship, what is that really like? You know, I used to think, well, it must be like, like, like Star Trek, but on these, on these ships, it wasn't like that. I don't see Sulu sitting over there. I don't see beautiful Aurora. I don't see Spock over here at the stations. It wasn't like that, okay? Instead, there are these, um, these eggs. The first one I was like, these eggs, very large metal type of egg, eggs, and they're like, appear to be like almost a plexiglass of some type on the outside, and in the back, they've got metal, and they go into these walls. These tubes go into the walls like nanotubes. And mind you, the walls are kind of like the inside of a mushroom on the ship, which means they were organic, okay? The ship right. itself is organic. Why a lot of them don't have windows. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, inside of this egg are these lights, all right? And a mist in there also. And in some rooms on the ship, there's mist also, especially like in a, a hybrid chamber, like a maturation chamber very thick uh, type of mist in there that makes it hard to breathe. To me, I think it's uh, something similar to nitrogen that causes the bins. Um, it kind of smells like ammonia or Windex. Um, anyway, sorry, these eggs. Inside these eggs are these lights floating around in the mist, okay? Different shaped lights, different colors. One I see is blue, one's yellow. One almost looks like a yellow Saturn, a uh, golden ball floating around in there, all right? I assumed these were propulsion units, some type of engine, some type of component like that, okay? Mm -hmm. I was wrong. Actually, once those lights emerged from the tube and helped me because I'm getting what they call temporal aphasia, which means I'm basically out of it, about to pass out. And so I'll tell you, as a physical, physically being on one of those environments is, for me, was not like what you see on TV, that's for sure, okay? It's hard to breathe. There's a, there's a distortment going on. Your senses are off. Um, it feels like you're being pulled down. I always wondered why I hated being on merry-go-rounds. That's why. It feels a lot like that. Okay. Um, anyway, so two of these lights emerge. One attaches here. One attaches here. And they start kind of changing my time field, trying to help with this temporal aphasia because it's about to end the experience because I was going to pass out, you know? So I found out, my goodness, these are a lot of times when the hypnotist would ask me, you know, what are the beings doing? I said, well, they're looking at these eggs, just like I am. I'm examining it. And I come to find out these things, these lights that came out, you know, those are crew members. Not just crew members, those are command officers. They're non-corporeal. And they don't come out of those chambers very much because even on the other part of that ship that can halfway allow them to exist here, uh, is very dangerous for them. And they certainly don't come out of the ship very often. This density is very gross and very um, negative, I think. They get entrenched in it. They called it, they described it to me as a type of pain. And they even said it feels like they're burning sometimes. So I didn't, I, I was a light being burned. That didn't make sense in our science. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, so many things that go on with the other entities that it's so hard for us to try to comprehend because it's out of our third dimension. It's out of anything that we've ever been taught or that we've ever imagined. Uh, so, you know, that, that's just absolutely fascinating. Uh, the theories all behind all of this. Um, yeah. The reason that I asked about the Palladians was because I had listened to some of uh, Barbara, Mar I think it's Marchak, 
I don't know how she pronounces her last name, but you know who I'm talking about, <laughs> Channel Sopladians. And she had said in one of her talks that the Palladians were the record keepers mm. or, or statisticians or librarians of Earth. And so when you brought that up, I thought, well, maybe that has something to do with the Palladians, that they are, you know, researching us or uh, – have something to do with our timeline you know i um i spent a lot of time when i was i'm sorry i can you know when when any inorganic being whether it be an organic doing telepathy or inorganic telepathy anything comes in my field of awareness like that i'm sorry i'm asking who you are what you want and i'm not going to leave it alone okay there's too much deception going on down here just like we see with the, the people that incarnate here, the souls that incarnate here, such great deception. I've got an inorganic being in my field of awareness. It's going to identify who it is. I'm going to feel it. I'm going to use my discernment. And I'm sorry, but I'm not going to allow it to take over my body so I can let it talk <laughs> to me. <laughs> I don't know who that being is, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and what their intentions are. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm criticizing all channelers, okay? It's not like that, but that doesn't work for me very good, okay? And I don't do it, all right? I don't, it's just not something now. You can get your information within your own soul frame without having to allow this body to be occupied by another conscious being. That's crap. right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Sometimes you got to know who you're dealing with. Yeah. Anybody can say this, like, if you, you know, if, if, if another being from another the galaxy, another part of the universe asks, where are you from? I say, hmm, I'm from the Milky Way. Gee, that really tells them who I am and what <laughs> sector of space I'm from, doesn't it? I'm from the Milky Way. That's so general. <laughs> well, I would think now, you know, what they do from their other realms doesn't necessarily make sense to us. But I would think that if they had something that they wanted to say and something that they wanted to project to us, that they wouldn't necessarily have to take over a human form in order to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Maybe yes. that came from my childhood where, you know, Marvin Martian came down in the spaceship during the cartoons and said, take me to your leader. But <laughs> you know, you know the funny thing about that? Martian Marvin the Martian is based on black extraterrestrial, black greys that inhabit mm -hmm. Mars. And that's right. what we talked about more and more. Um, you know, no one ever you know, I've been criticized this a little bit. Some people get upset because I've always brought up and just as far as as contactees, why are all the Pleiadians look like Fabio and Kevin Sporbo <laughs> and Christy Brinkley? And some right. people do. I'm sure they run the gamut. But nonetheless, in our culture, we don't hear much about either black extraterrestrials and it discouraged black experiencers like myself from coming forward. So when I bring that up, that's why I say, and the more I'm bringing it up, the more I'm starting to hear people talking to me. They'll talk to me in private. Actually, I've experienced a black extraterrestrial, but they don't want to say it publicly. Very interesting. But Martian, but uh, Marvin the Martian was based on this type of gray that supposedly inhabits uh, Mars that was from Tau Ceti that is so close to the planet, so close to the sun, that they developed that type of melanin. Okay? Right. So whether or not that's true, it's... Interesting information. Food for thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have recently found, I guess, uh, some type of um, housing or buildings or something on Mars. Did, have you seen that? Uh, only as far as Sidonia. Um, when Sidonia, when Richard Hoagland, uh, back probably about 1993 was the first time I heard him, on the Art Bell show, late at night because I can't uh -huh. see um, uh, he, uh, <laughs> he wrote a book called Dark Mission uh, about, and he worked with NASA for a long time, but he exposed Cydonia and also the dark side of the moon, certain artifacts that are there, which include the shard, uh, what they call the palace, and on Cydonia, they've got what, the pyramid, and there's a book called, um, oh, the Cydonia Code X. And what it does is has a bunch of symbols that are some of them Mason symbols that are seen around the Sidonia area. Um, it's quite interesting, actually. A little, some of the 
decryption of the information is a little beyond me. I don't know a whole lot about all that, but uh, it's very interesting to look at nonetheless. And the supposed is what he calls, what that author calls the Cydonia complex. And he shows how the pyramid there in the face and how that probably once was before it was destroyed. It's very interesting, you know. I would one of the one of the members of the chat room wants me to ask if you was ever touched by the historians. <laughs> wow. Okay, that's a cool that's a cool question. The answer is yes. Every seven years, I've encountered one. Um, two of them that did I did have physical contact with. Um, I can say that touching them wasn't any different than touching a person, with the exception of the energy. But you will detect their energy at first. Okay, I did another video um, in which I and I had to deal with this because I I kind of was like, why is everything Nordic? The Nordic beings, and I had to do a regression for the first ship I saw as a child, and I couldn't remember it, and I could remember everything. For my mother passed, she. I talked about, I can't believe you don't remember that. When well, you can remember I was taking to get a toy, you can remember Stretch Armstrong, but you can't remember seeing a, a UFO? And I said, I was, what? And I knew it had to have been involving them, okay? That's the only time I forget anything like that. It's that sync, that that, uh, that that temporal sync, that vibrational difference. Okay, so I was, uh, I see this ship. A year later, I'm in a store with my mother. She was an antique collector. And she was junking, so she's collecting stuff. And as a kid, oh Lord, I was about seven. Very boring. But um, in, the, <laughs> in this uh, in this store, though, on one side they have all these books and fascinating books and a large rock collection. And I collected rocks, and there was a rock there I saw that I wanted. This gentleman comes from behind the can uh, counter back there, so I thought he worked there. And he starts talking to me about. Uh, this rock and geology and saying things to me that you wouldn't say to a seven-year-old unless you knew something about him. He comes up to me, he says, young man, do you think metamorphic rocks or uh, igneous rocks are metamorphic by nature? And I just looked at him. I said, well, yeah, but it takes millions of years and that sucks. It needs to be like instant, like Lou Ferrigno and Bill Bixby, instant change. You know, anyway, <laughs> but uh, he gave me a rock. He gave me that rock. He placed it in my hand, okay? Another charter I met actually had uh, touched my hand, too. So they felt like people in that way. And that makes me say that humanity is much more than just biology. You know what I mean? But they appeared to be bio biologically like us. But I could feel them in the beginning. And the What kind of energy did they put off? Okay, I would say, like, you know, if you meet someone that's really erratic, and almost like ADHD, sometimes they have an energy that pushes you a little bit. You know what I mean? Somebody like that, you just, oh, they've got energy that makes you erratic. They're kind of like that, but it's not assaultive. It's just faster. And the female charter that I met, and she was actually um, ethnic uh, melanin dominant when I met her, but I couldn't place it first until she was such a strong telepath. I mean, she was so strong that she started reading me. So I put up a shield, you know, we all can shield ourselves. I got a pretty good shield. I put up a shield and <laughs> it was like, Captain, the day, the lithium crystals are gone. She crashed through my shields and kept reading me. I couldn't stop her. That's when I was like, okay, whoa, who is this? And that, when they're gone, I put it together. Like, okay, it was one of them. But she was interacting with other people. They knew her. You know what I mean? But that, but that didn't mean that they, do they know where she came from? Where she goes when she left? Probably not. <laughs> Um, so in that way, to answer that question, I'm sorry I got drawn out. But, yeah, they felt physically, these two did. But it wasn't like a long touch, no more than like if I shook your hand or something. But they felt human, but you can detect their energy at first, and that precedes the physical contact, if that makes sense. Yeah. It wasn't like a, a negative type of No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. I think that they're trying to help us wake up in a certain way. And – when I say that they're historians, and why would they be coming into contact with lifetime experiencers every seven years? So it makes you wonder, who are we? How important are each of us truly? And are some of them us keeping charts on ourselves? I can tell you some of the ships some of us seen are us. We talk about things like what's called the Merkaba body, the astral body, the dream body. But the astral, the Merkaba body is supposed to be able to be formed into a vessel 
consciously. So that tells you that a lot of these ships that come in our atmosphere are conscious thought forms. When they get into our atmosphere, the density causes them to have, have, start having physical manifestations. And then our own cognitive dissonance does the rest of it. We start having to see something that we can put in a frame of reference. It also leads us to be deceived very easily by holographic technology, but that's another subject, sorry. Well, you know, you mentioned that uh, they, now my, my train of thought's derailing. I'm, too many thoughts running through my mind all at one time. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good thing, right? <laughs> I only have one brain cell and it's on life support. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, let's see. You you, you mentioned that uh, the the crafts and how you know they kind of pop in and out of of the of our reality, so to speak. You know, the, I've seen lots of films where they'll they'll have zoomed in on one of these UFOs. You know, we have to assume that at this point that it's probably alien, and then all of a sudden. It goes into some type of a, I don't know if it's a warp drive or uh, if it's a telepathic thing, but it just, bam, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you would think naturally due to how the Cinemax kind of does it, you would think that when you see that flash, it's like the Millennium Falcon. Chewie, go to warp light speed and it's <laughs> boom when they're gone, you know, or the Enterprise jumps into the, it's gone. Not quite. What you're witnessing is, uh, most of the time, is a frequency jump. Okay, so actually they're changing their vibration only to a higher vibration. And so for us, they disappear in this dimension, especially visually. I mean, anything even goes in infrared, we can't see it anymore with our human eyes. So a lot of times when people are seeing that flash of light, they're going into a different frequency. And there's another phenomenon I've been talking a lot about. Um, it's something that uh, Dr. Rudy Shields from, uh, I think it's from Berkeley there, and several other quantum physics are calling, physicists are calling the quantum hologram. I did a video on this, um, it, which is actually like kind of if you have a wormhole, like a black hole, on the out, or both on the outside of that, it's actually uh, whatever goes into it, there's a copy made of it on the outside, um, just on just the aperture of the, of the wormhole itself. And that's an exact copy, and they're calling that also the quantum hologram. So a lot of times people will see a ship, okay, there'll be just one, then all of a sudden there'll be two of them, and right. then there'll be one, and one disappears, okay? I mean, like, one, I'm sorry, there'll be two, one will disappear, there'll just be one, and then they'll just, it'll be gone too, okay? What people are actually seeing is that quantum hologram as they're making that frequency jump and jumping into that wormhole, going into that wormhole. And that's why the other one can't stay long. It can't hold the vibration here very long. So it disappears okay. too. You feel me? You'll see a lot of people yeah. taking pictures of something be two lights and there'll be one. That's a pretty common phenomenon. So that's what you're seeing is a frequency jump uh, more when they just disappear like that. Well, you'd also mentioned about uh, we don't know exactly what we are. We don't understand our capabilities. Uh, Peter Maxwell Slattery had even mentioned that uh, several times in some of the things that he says where he is interacting with the beings and they say, you don't know who you are, do you? Uh, <laughs> have you ever encountered that with the beings that you have come in contact with? Yes, yes. Peter's a good friend of mine. I'm actually going to get to meet him in person in about three days. Ah, east. you're going up to the city, huh? Yeah, we're going to speak up there. Yeah, so um, uh, correct. You know, I was told that also. And when using a frame of reference for not knowing what we are, most, although I may not be religion, most every religion that I've looked at, almost every person I've talked to will all say they believe we are immortal soul, that the soul is immortal. So that means we are immortal soul beings, all right? And if we're immortal soul beings, and yet we incarnate here, and we have no soul life memories that can hardly help us, okay, uh, that means we definitely don't have any idea what we are. And looking at it in terms of like Star Trek, you know, there's a, a being there called Q. And, and next generation, you could snap his fingers and like swing planets into orbit and change the space time continuum, okay? Now, for beings like that, that would be an immortal soul being, omnipotent, omniscient, 
Uh, I think they even did an episode about that. What's left? If you know the outcome of every quantum game, every quantum outcome, both past and future, right. what's left? There's not much left except for to maybe um, trick yourself into forgetting everything and then go back and discovering everything again. There's not much else left. And I'm sure there's all too many beings that are more than willing to assist us in remaining asleep. <laughs> right. Right. As, we As a all matter know. of fact, there was, um, oh gosh, can't think of who it was now, but they said that when we depart this earth, and go to the light that before we are incarnated back into this life that our soul memories are like electrocuted out of our system so that we don't remember and we come back slate wipe clean mm -hmm. In most cases, not all cases, but in most cases, it's pretty clean, and we start all over again. Yeah, that's a, you know I've talked about that quite a bit too. There's there's um and that whoever people say that is correct. There's a thing that um, a scalar frequency, like Nikola Tesla discovered, scalar. All right, you've got right. scalar frequencies that are emitted in the solar system. One of them coming from the dark side of the moon, from one of those uh, shards back there. You've got others on Mars. You've got ones on Saturn, in the rings of Saturn, okay, that are generating this frequency. And when our soul comes into the solar system, and before we incarnate, we pass through that scalar frequency, okay? And anyone that really wants to look up what's called orgone energy, discovered by Wilhelm Reich, life energy, right. product energy, and experiments that were really done with that energy, it has an antagonistic problem and uh, conflict with electricity. I'm not saying that the universe, I, you know, some people, the electric universe, people are getting a little upset with that. It is what it is. It's been shown. Yeah. That's why when you have certain craft that come over, you know, Richard Dreyfuss showed that. When, when UFOs come over certain uh, areas, power goes out, cars go out, and as soon as they leave, it, it regages. It's that ether field that surrounds those ships that is shutting everything down like that, okay? So our soul is made of a great deal of orgone energy. So we come in to give it an electric shock, a high shock like that, it's going to have some catastrophic effects, okay? And my understanding is, and I do believe this, having died and not being able to remember all of my near-death experience, some of it, but not all of it, I'm pretty sure I hit that net when I was kind of starting to go out and then came back, you know, but that's, you know, I'm speaking from there from experience. There's a reason why the transition between life and soul body it's so much is lost and there's others i think sometimes death itself wants us our life memories you had shamans that spent lifetimes doing the recap recapitulation of their life bringing energy back so they could remember every part of their life so that when the death force did hit them it would be satisfied with the recap and leave the soul memories intact i think there's a lot that should be looked at with that sorry that's going way off on what you were asking well, that's okay. That's okay. Fred House Friday. <laughs> yeah, I'm famous for that. Jump around on topics. Gosh. I, I apologize. I've got another question from the chat room. She says to ask if he is aware if the energy that, of, let's see, um, I went to public school. I don't read good. <laughs> ask if he is aware if the energy that goes beyond the grave slash death. Am I aware of that energy? Yes. No, oh, that would I mean that would be the soul energy more than anything. And also your own intent. I mean, everything's woven together in that way. You know, so you have to think about even energy physics is shown in our science here. Energy isn't destroyed, it just reforms and carries on in a different form. So it's gonna be the same thing for our soul energy. But you know, when um a lot of people, like I think they've heard um so I heard on my mother before she passed. They call it, the, I believe, the death shackles, that rattling right. that you hear in the breathing. All right? right. A lot of times that is the energy that runs our body, our soul energy, that electricity disconnecting from the physical body. And it causes that up, that sound like that. The same way a lot of people that, like my brother, he can astral project just 
I mean, whenever he's tired, he seems to be able to do it, whatever. It's spontaneous. For me, I got to work at that, man. But um, he says always, oh, man, well, I know what's about to happen because I start vibrating. He starts going like this. <laughs> he, said, <"It> feels like <laughs> he said, it feels like that, and I take off. I leave the body. So there's that kind of dislodging effect there that is probably the same energy and the same that she's talking about there. Um, I definitely believe it definitely survives the transition of death to take on another body and that this is actually a huge reincarnation and soul refacting refactoring cycle or recycle factory we live in, in my opinion. Well then they want to know if you have encountered the orbs. Yes. And I will expand on that and say what are the orbs? You know the ones I encountered orb wise were uh nature spirits. And then before a physical experience, I started encountering the orbs. They were more like golden bu bubbles. There were billions of them. And I think they were life energy, probably souls to a certain degree. Um, you know, if you remember, um, it was probably, gosh, 20 some years ago, there was a thing in Africa, in Zimbabwe, a thing with the school children that all saw this ship and saw this gray and the gray said, please take care of the planet and yada, 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 okay? As those children are now in their 30s, some of them, and when remote viewers looked at that, and what some of the children can remember themselves now is not actually seeing uh, extraterrestrial there or a light being there or a gray being, what they're actually seeing was these orbs were surrounding them. Just these orbs, and they're all standing there kind of trashed out by these orbs. So we're also dealing sometimes with what must also be probably pockets of other universes probably in there, which takes us into bubble theory quite a bit that probably doesn't answer crap but hey that was the answer <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's what i would say that so the orbs i think they have uh several functions you know i think you have different types of them probably because like the ink the nature spirits i saw tended to be either a golden color or uh, a pinkish kind of as to where the orbs uh, you see around people a lot sometimes they're red but a lot of times they're like a silver color so I think they're probably, and I don't know where we met, where we can gauge what is a spirit or what is a universe. And since we're immortal soul beings, we might be able, through our own intent and imagination, create universes. See what I mean? It takes us into a whole another deal of consciousness. It really does. Especially if we're created in the image of our creator, okay? Right which can obviously manifest universes through intent of will. That's a whole nother, if we have that capability, yeah, we don't remember what we are, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, have you experienced any of the winged beings? You know, I can honestly tell you not to that degree. Um, I've had more encounters with animal guides that are winged um, I would recommend anybody look at Ken Carey's book called The, the Bird Tribe, The Return of the Bird Tribes. That's a really good book. Uh, he describes a lot how Native Americans and other Indians have, um, some, some also ancient Africans, have uh, a knowledge of these ancient bird beings. Okay? And right now, it, it takes us into something that a lot of people hear that, gosh, I want to say this. Somebody's going to get hated on for this. David Wilcox and Corey Good. Always talking about the blue avians. The blue avians are coming with the space secret space program, and it sounds great. Okay, I've not seen the blue avians. I don't resonate with that. It doesn't mean it's not true, but um, as far as being bird beings here, I do honestly believe that, and I think that maybe um, that's going to become even more prevalent as first contact arrives. You know what I mean? And right. first contact is not what people think. It's not people getting off on ships on the the on the um, White House lawn. It's not gonna be the Vulcans come down after we break war. Oh, peace of it, it's, it's more happening now, but it's happening on the super conscious level. People that are seeing some of these ships, they gotta realize some of this is contact, contact, because I mean, it's it's targeted contact. You may be sitting in a, in a crowd of 10 people and you see a huge ship there, man, what is that? And there's another person going, man, that's incredible. Other people are going, what, what, where? I don't see nothing. They can't. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. it, it's, it's only meant for the person that it's meant for. Mm -hmm. And the people that see that and other people didn't, 
that's when you really need to take it to the next level. And like I did, I tried all that stuff. I couldn't remember my missing time. Even if you witnessed that thing for just a couple of seconds, somebody else couldn't see it, or you were looking at it, you look up and the minute is gone, even just a minute, you know, go get yourself regressed with a, by a real hypnotist. Have them take you down to Theta and try to find out who was on that ship, why you were able to see it, what message were you really communicated with. And when we're dealing with vibrations that are 20 times faster than us, a whole lot of information is relayed. Pow! You know what I mean? Or right. as people like you know, download. I always use that because I think it's always an open channel a lot of the time. Anyway. Well, there are many people that believe that the aliens are on Earth, not necessarily just walking among us, but that they live under the ocean or in the mountains or that sort of thing. What, what are your feelings on that? Well, I know that there are <clears throat> some cities. They're like small cities inside of mountains on this planet. I do know that. And if you listen to somebody like um, gosh, Shirley MacLaine, Shirley MacLaine has that ranch out in um, around the uh, the mine, the I don't want to say it's so, Cadera mine, where all the crystals exploded and they're kind of around there. And you know they've been stars that have been out there in her, in her hot tub, her hot tub, and say that they've seen UFOs going to the mountain and dematerialize before they get to the mountain, before they hit it, and dematerialize apparently coming out of it. Same thing, okay. Um, also the inner Earth. And when I've been seeing this, you to remember that the inner earth, the hollow earth thing isn't quite as correct as the inner earth is full of catacombs. And some of these catacombs are uh, cities or large installations, bases. I think that's far more realistic. The amount of USO activity you see, um, you not are unidentified sub submerged objects, especially around, um, is it? Oh, my brother always laughs at this place. Palace Verdes in California. Is that, is that the right? Palace Verdes? They see stuff yeah. coming out of the water all the time over there. You know, why? There's got to be a reason for it. There's got to be something in there. And the greatest place to hide on this planet to get away from the, 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 the dangerous population that exists here on unstable platonic plates, <laughs> and so you don't have to run around like Sasquatch trying to disappear all the time, would be to be hidden in, in the ocean or in mountains. That'd be the best way. <laughs> or just to plain stay frequencies away from us. <laughs> well, that brings me to another question. And we got one in the chat room, but I'll ask this one first. You talked about Sasquatch. Sasquatch is an alien, right? What's that? Sasquatch is an alien, right? You know, oh, well, you know, I, I, that's not for me to say. I will say this. I think we've been with so many different strains of hominid that it goes unreal finding so many different hominids like the nutcracker man anyone can look that up the nutcracker man that's a new hominid they just discovered that was um a, a herbivore okay straight herbivore but uh nonetheless you do have that several sasquatch have been seen on board craft by experiencers okay um we've got something else like okay give me an example all right um I met a gentleman when I was much younger during a sweat lodge. Uh, he was a Choctaw, okay, and also a Chickasaw gentleman also. But they said that uh, their elders, they were elders, they said that their ancestors had trading agreements with Sasquatch, with Bigfoot, and that the Sasquatch were terrible traders. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we would, we taught them how to make like fish nets, and instead of making their own nets, they just take the fish out of our nets. And then <laughs> we taught them how to make tools, instead of uh, actually <laughs> making their own tools, they stole ours and then left the fish that they took <laughs> so, so as a trade. <laughs> or sometimes, or something interesting he said, or sometimes they leave up pieces of obsidian. It's come, you know, come from volcanoes. That's pretty interesting. But anyway, he said they were ter terrible traders, so they were trying to break the trading agreement. And then um, the settlers showed up with gunpowder and the Sasquatch retreated to the high points to never interact with humanity again. And I always thought that story was fascinating. Sometimes you gotta listen to the native people, you know? <laughs> but <laughs> One of the things that I'll do when I'm in the chat room, uh, uh, you know, and maybe the conversation is going south, you know, I'll just type up there, Sasquatch is an alien. <laughs> well, you know, you got, you got people like, um, there's been a couple of reports, and Dr. Linda Moulton Howes dealt with that a lot. Um, 
some like ranchers that have seen a UFO out in the field, and all of a sudden there'll be a flash of light, somebody getting beamed down, basically, and they'll see these extraterrestrial coming down that are almost resemble uh, Filipinos, they say. Um, very, very much so, but with these certain uh, suits on, and they go down into the pasture, and a second later there's another flash of light, and there's an albino Sasquatch that goes behind them and down there. You know, and there's been a lot of talk of do the um, Sasquatch have access to the inner earth, okay, and into the portals. A lot of people have seen them dematerializing. One of my Native American friends, I know two people have seen Sasquatches, and one of them said, I swear it disappeared before it got to the foliage. It just seemed to dematerialize, all right? Now, if we're dealing with that, we're dealing with things like what's called the gate of power, uh, any, a, a true tribe, which is what I was told they're a tribe, I believe that, all right? So you're going to have shamans of that tribe also that practice a, a number of things, like the thing called the gate of power, introduced by Carlos Castaneda, but uh, that's an effective technique that was utilized by the great walkers. You remember they walked across the Bering Strait? No one knows how they did it. Okay, if you take that and take it back that far, and now you've got a Sasquatch, who's got a slightly different physical build than us for the terrain, and they're able to do like the gate of power, and that puts this in a whole nother realm. And sometimes I often think like many of the animals, it's us that's asleep, it's not them. Most you have animals that can recognize you based on their descendants knew you. And you're dealing with some of these animals that are the birds you were feeding. Some of these birds, same type of birds like you now, 50 years later in your life, it's probably that they're descendants of those beings. Okay, their descendants and that genetic memory, that race memory is passed on. They recognize you. It's us that's asleep, not them. <laughs> and one is asking here, is that the same as the Nephilim? That goes into my past life memories, and it conflicts with what we hear quite a bit. For me, I remember coming here from somewhere else, not Sirius, not Vega, from much further than that. We're dealing with another galaxy. Coming here, all right? then beginning hybrid projects. And I believe that probably happened again before I can remember. There's been several cycles here. But the Nephilim I hear talk about now were hybrids between what was the race that was known as the sons of God, not Anunnaki. I remember what's called Anunnaki now being partially reptilian. No offense to that, but it was a different deal. Those were not the blacks here with the elongated craniums that were in Moot, okay? Um, those are known as the sons of God. And the hybrid project would invi involve the sons of God and the sons of men. And the sons of men were some of the bigger, like Australopithecus and Gigantopithecus, beings like that. And you're doing a hybrid project. That's why some of these hybrids were huge like that. And you had these tyrants, all right, that had some of the spiritual gifts of the sons of God, but also the physical carnage of their often mothers, the, the, son, the, son, the sons of men. See what I mean? So that creates that, but you have also several, what I remember, several different eugenics and like three stages of hybrids all the way up until Mu was destroyed and uh, some of the sons of God flew to Egypt, sorry, escaped to Egypt and other places. Most places you'll see pyramids and things of that nature to protect the technology that could convert energy into matter, matter into energy. But Nephilim's, uh, my memory, is that they had the gifts of the sons of God. They had the craniums, okay? So they were able to gain initiation into the temples, uh, into, the, into the technology. Once they got that, the carnal natures arrived, um, some of the black pyramid type of things arise, and it destroyed everything in them. Oh, it started, it was kind of in a couple of cataclysms, but that was the first one. Always pay attention to the never ending story. Remember that? Uh -huh. Yep. You know what the greatest ne ne nemesis was in that movie? It wasn't the rock guy. It wasn't the pretty dog that flew around. <laughs> it, <laughs> it was the nothing. The nothing was actually the force that was dissolving Fantasia, whatever they called it, but it was turning energy or matter into energy. Okay? That's exactly what these devices did. And then once it went awry, you've got devices that are turning matter into direct energy and destroying eroded things. That's, you know, just there's all sorts of secrets hidden in different movies. And it's interesting. Right. Yeah, a lot of symbolism. Um, we got another question from the chat room. 
Is it Jeremy? Is it no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jeremy <laughs> wants to know if you are aware of Gary McKinnon. Terrence McKinnon? Uh, no, Gary McKinnon. McKinnon. Uh, no, no, not especially. No. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of that one either. Sounds a little so. familiar, but I, I got to be honest. I'm not great with everybody's names, but it sounds slightly familiar. I don't know. Maybe if I knew what he actually dealt with more. I... I'm looking through the list here. I'm not seeing any new questions involved with that. Okay. He, he said, okay, thanks. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. I couldn't help with that one. Well, I mean, we can't know everybody, can we, Barry? <laughs> oh, I want to be cool. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> That's my William Shatner impression. How, how, how do you deal with all your YouTube uh, and uh, experiencer uh, fame? Well, you know, YouTube, I'm new to YouTube, to be honest. I only started that channel probably about uh, five months ago or so. And I'll be honest, much like the interviews, I didn't want to do it. And I had a friend that was really just pressing me to do this. So you really need to do this, man. Get this body of work out there. He's a cool brother. He set it up and we, we do the videos. So, and I like it actually because I didn't never think, to be honest, anybody would watch them, let alone enjoy them. So that's been more of a blessing. The account, the attacks I've gotten from the YouTube channel have been minimal compared to what I've seen other experiencing experiencers get. So I guess I'm pretty blessed. Um, far as the interviews, uh, Peter Maxwell Slattery, I met him when he first put up his first regression, probably uh, three minutes after he posted it. And I just got done dealing with my third regression that a couple of things happened during it that blew me away. It wasn't negative, it just blew me away. And Peter, uh, during his posted regression, had similar things. So I do my day business on uh, online too. So I, I had contacted him through another social media deal and said, hey, you know, I was checking out your deal and we started becoming friends. He started that show. He's like, I want you to be one of my first guests. Will you do it? I was like, no. <laughs> and he just wouldn't let it go, though. He kept asking again and again and again. He has me over to a friend's house. that uh, is another experience here that works with my father in contracting. And uh, they just to show me how to do Skype, and we wind up doing this show, this interview. And since then, people keep asking me to do them, so I, I comply. It just blows me away, to be honest. And living where I live, which is somewhat remote, um, I didn't think anyone near me would ever see any of this. <laughs> ah, I was wrong. <laughs> well, see, now, I've told everybody that now that I'm a big YouTube star, you know, I, I'm, I'm the co-host on this channel, and I have my other channel, and now that I'm a big YouTube star, I have to dress up to go to Walmart. <laughs> because I, I walk in there and everybody wants my autograph because I'm this big YouTube star and I can't wear my leopard stretchy pants and flip flops at the Walmart no more. And everybody thinks I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, I, think, I, I, think, I think I'm pretty lucky because I don't think most people know I have a YouTube channel probably or haven't seen it. And I operate through Facebook a lot and I found just a few hours ago that it was shut off in a way that most people can't send me requests. So I didn't know why I was only getting from some people. You know what I mean? But I, I get it now. Uh -huh. So clean that up a little bit more. But otherwise, I'm pretty much unknown. So I have nothing to sell. I have nothing to offer. So there's uh, a... <laughs> well, you have knowledge. You have knowledge to offer. You know, I see a lot of people right now that come forward and they're know-it-alls or they're trying to make money and get famous at this. And I'm sorry, this is the awakening. This isn't something you're to get famous at. If it happens, I guess it happens. But... That's not why you're doing any of this. And I'm sorry, as far as I can see, talking about extraterrestrials, interdimensional beings, and spiritual gifts isn't going to make you rich. You know, it's just, it just doesn't work that way. In fact, that might even be interfering with the divine plan if you're not careful. you got to make a living, but don't do exploitation. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. I do know what you mean. Well, Barry, we've been on an hour now, and I don't want to keep you all day, but I did want to get everybody introduced to you here that uh, view the channel and give them an opportunity to, to listen to a little bit of what uh, you have experienced because I find it absolutely fascinating, and I thought they might enjoy it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I really appreciate thing, you joining me. 
you know, one thing I didn't answer, um, the beings I've dealt with are part of an alliance, um, not any name that we've heard, okay? Um, actually, Galactic Interdimensional Cooperative Alliance. It took me 30 years to get that name, but it was so vague I wouldn't say it because it was worse than Star Trek. But that's something I didn't say before and why I can't always tell you every special being and where they're from. They don't talk like that. You know what I mean? So Right. That's all. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's fine. Uh, I, it, this is such, um, well, alien concept, you know, because we're, we're third dimensional beings. And, uh, you know, it's not something that we are taught in school. It's not something that we've been brought up with. You know, this is a whole new concept. And I, I believe that every experiencer's experience is different. Yes, yes, yes. Because the consciousness is different. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But, you know, if you've seen a ship, if you've seen one, go get regressed. It costs a little money, but just try it. You know, try it. See, play with your own consciousness. Expand your own awareness. It's just perception. That's all it is. <laughs> uh, opening the mind can be an absolutely fascinating thing. Uh, you know, I think too many people just kind of sit around in their own shell with whatever it is that they have been uh, taught at home and in the schools and in the churches. And the, they're taught not to expand, not to learn, not to uh, delve into other realms and, and possibilities. And that it's so limiting. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we're only here in this life for a very short period of time. And if we are shocked into not remembering what we have gone through in this life, you only have, you know, whatever years you're here, why not investigate everything? You know, and part of it, when our perception is molded as babies, as babies, a lot of us can still see. That's why they scream when they first breathe. It's like, oh, my Lord. They see all the gross density here. Oh, you know, but we still see we get trained out of it as we grow older, you know. And then as adults, just to raise our family and pay the bills takes maximum energy, maximum concentration, and it takes away from all these things that are paranormal that our other senses, our natural psychic abilities, we're born with. They're nullified. And that's done purposely. It's more than just yes. survival. Yes, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Well, I believe, I, I haven't seen any more questions come up in the, the chat. I will tell you this, Jeremy typed up here that uh, Gary McKinnon hacked or stumbled on to Navy logs of the U.S. secret space program. He found uh, vessel names and crew lists, and these were off planet. The U.S. government has been trying to get him. Yeah, okay, that, that, that guy, yeah, the red-haired guy that does interviews drinking the, the tall glass of brew. Okay, yeah, you know, he's fascinating. Yeah, I, I, I have listened to him. I didn't know his name, but yeah, I've listened to him. You know, uh, what's really interesting is some of the names he starts giving out. And he starts talking about some of the different beings that were logged as officers that weren't human. He goes into that quite a bit. And I think that's interesting. And yeah, they were, he was definitely on the list to get got. No doubt about that. But, you know, nowadays, nobody seems to listen to him because he just got either shut up or what he's saying couldn't be real. Yeah, that's probably real. But secret space program. Richard Hoagland talked about that all the time, you know, in a real yeah. Okay, I'll ask you this before we go. I have... <laughs> read you know you, you read all kinds of stuff and you don't know what to believe or what you know what's real and what's not but there has been talk of different individuals that are like high up in the government going to mars for some sort of a mars project do you know anything about that mm -hmm. i've heard you know i've heard other people talk about it like a andrew basago and people like that i think corey good a lot of those people are saying that and they're conspiracy people. I tend to stay away from the conspiracy stuff because my contact didn't involve the government, really. You know, I thank God. But um, I would say this. There's a technology that they're calling them jump rooms. Really, they it's quantum synthetic environments. And for any of us that like Star Trek, that's taken on the next generation. They had the hollow rooms, the, hol the, hol the holodecks. I'm sorry, holodecks. And the holodecks were similar but it said if you take that to a more advanced uh, science than that and start integrating uh, particle synthesis, okay, you're going to have a complete environment. 
And my understanding that one of these jump rooms, the specific holographic for that was Mars. So you have okay. several people that are thinking they went to Mars, but really they're in these jump rooms. That's ah, okay. You know? So I don't know. And I, I would just question how much any of us could really exist on Mars any more than I can't survive on the ships very long. I don't think I can walk around the atmosphere of Mars unless it's subterranean and be all right. So it implies it's probably a quantum synthetic environment, but we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. That goes into what I call BRST, virtual reality scenario technology. I've been exposed to it myself. I went and got it regression to see if I've been exposed to it, all right? And mine was coming from a, a higher being, higher levels, and they told me, they showed, they showed it to me, but it's been degraded by lower beings, slower vibrational beings to deceive people. And holographic projection systems is the perfect way, especially if you're a higher a being that's able to consciously project images into somebody else's mind, even if it's just subtle. It doesn't take much to have a technology to huh, make somebody asleep. <laughs> well, what do you know about um, alien implants? Implants being, you know, aliens implanting uh, antennas and, you know, different things into the human body, things that we can't physically see, but <laughs> allow them to manipulate us or, uh, you know, I don't know. My take on this is that is this um, you've got two different types of implants I'm familiar with. The first one, the one I was always more interested in, is the ones that were um, analyzed by Dr. Roger Lear. He was pulling them out of people and actually doing scientific analysis on physical objects. Okay, those, and then we've got another type of implants that I think are done from hostile interdimensional beings, some type of a scalar technology like nanotechnology that they might be sticking to us also. Um, almost out of sync with us. But as far as the physical ones, and when you look at some of the things that Dr. Lear, they, everything these things do, they're meeting a frequency they're not sure of, UHA frequencies or VHF, something like that. Um, I think that what some of these may do, people say, oh, they're tagging us. Tag I didn't get tagged. Are you kidding me? I think what it is is maybe making the experiencers, contactees, more um, open to being subjected to virtual reality scenario technology. I think it makes it easier to track them and easier to make them exposed to it and to deceive them. That's my personal feeling. Uh, I have not experienced the implants, so I'm not an expert on it. I to also okay. don't remove them. That's a big thing right now, removing implants. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> right, fair enough. Yeah, I'll just say be aware of who you have removing anything from you, anyone you have working on your on your energy field and make sure they're not implanting you themselves right. and be aware of it. Food for thought. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Barry, you know, we've been going over an hour here and I didn't want to take up your whole day, but uh, uh, I really do appreciate you coming on the show today. It has been absolutely fantastic. I'd like to thank everybody in our chat room for coming on uh, and, and participating in the show today. I hope everybody enjoyed the show and learned a little something and expanded your mind. That's the importantest thing of all is to expand your mind. So with that, I think that uh, we're going to end the broadcast for today. And uh, we uh, hope you all join us back on Monday at noon when Pat comes back and sees what a mess I've made with the frat house party and his in his house for two days. I've been unsupervised for two days, Barry, and I've just run them up. <laughs> so we will say goodbye to everybody for today and see you next week. Thank you very much.